Hello, welcome back to our lecture series for Western Civilization 101. On our previous lecture, we learned about the uh, invasions that will um, occur in, on the European continent in the 9th and 10th centuries that will basically shape what will uh, the topic of this lecture, which is the development of feudalism. You had learned, of course, um, one of the groups that uh, we see a lot with the invasion, um, not only along the coast of Europe, in around the North Sea, and of course along the coast of France, down even around the coast of Spain into the Mediterranean, but these Vikings will also be able to uh, invade inland because their boats were, so, they had such a shallow hull, their boats were able to traverse the rivers. And we see, of course, they do so a lot in Eastern Europe. And so these invasions will help um, the development of feudalism in Europe at this time in history. The kings could not protect the people. They were distant. And if you were, uh, especially if you were living along the coast, a lot of times these local people would look to their local aristocracy or lords or nobility um, to give them protection from these invaders. These uh, <clears throat> lords, of course, this nobility, they were vassals of the king, but they themselves could also have vassals. And uh, it, it's a special relationship, basically. Um, the aristocracy, the nobility, will gain more and more power as a result of feudalism. And this will lead to a new political and military order in Europe um, at this time in history. The lords would offer protection uh, in exchange for services. So we, we have this contract, which is the basis for feudalism. Um, because of we don't see a very strong central government. It's ineffective, that central government, the monarchy. Um, and there's a threat of famine during the early Middle Ages. There is disease and, of course, these foreign invasions um, <clears throat> where the weak will look to the strong for protections. Vassals would swear an oath of loyalty and they would fight for their lords. They would receive, these vassals would receive land it's called fiefs, in exchange for their services. It was possible for a vassal to buy his way out of military service so that the noble or lord could hire mercenaries. Um, of course, this is the time when we start seeing the, the knights, um, of course, very popular in, in Hollywood and movies. Um, the soldiers that were armed, they had uh, coats of mail and long lances and uh, bigger horses, of course, because in fact it was kind of dangerous if you were a knight because your armor was so heavy that there were instances where these men, if they fell into a river or if they fell off their horse, they would drown because they, they couldn't get out of the water. Um, and of course these soldiers at this time in history were called knights. And there was a, a public ceremony um, with feudalism between the Lord and the vassal, where the vassal performed an act of homage or homage uh, to his Lord. And, and this whole vassalage involved what's called fealty uh, to the Lord, which means a promise not to take any action that might threaten the Lord's well-being to uh, do services on his request, like military duty. Maybe he gets captured, maybe, maybe your um, your Lord gets captured, well, then you would be required to help come up with a ransom. We'll see that uh, instead of outright killing some of these nobility during war times, we see a lot of ransoming of not only the nobility, but in some instances, kings themselves will be ransomed, um, which will, of course, help make a lot of money for whoever captured them in the first place. You could have a liege lord because you could, uh, you could be a vassal to more than one person. And so if, if the, say, the two people that you're, you've gotten land from, you've gotten fiefs from, if they're fighting, then you would have one that you would always have to go with. 
This was a very decentralized kind of system, as you'll see in this lecture, um, because there are so many people that are, are building up their own armies and military to help fight off these foreign invasions. So the kings will be very weak at this time. It's not until the high Middle Ages that we're going to start seeing the kings um, solidifying their power um, a bit more. And of course, eventually, we'll see the monarchies in a lot of these European countries become absolute. Um, eventually, of course, that will happen, not right now. Now, we also have um, manneralism, and this goes hand in hand with feudalism. And all this is is like a village farm. Um, the, the lord, the local uh, nobility, they own these manors or these farming estates, and they would have peasants that would work the land. Um, and these peasants, of course, for the privilege of, of farming on the Lord's land or fishing in his pond, would have to also do services for um, the manor, the Lord. Because a lot of these aristocrats will, will be away fighting. Um, in fact, when we start seeing um, peace in the high Middle Ages, these, uh, the aristocracy will hold tournaments. So they'll hold mock fighting, mock battles, which will keep them occupied um, and also, of course, keep them trained for when they do go to war. So quite a lot about uh, the development of feudalism, and let's learn a little bit more. In an earlier lecture, you learned about the collapse of orderly government uh, in Western Europe after the death of Charlemagne in the mid-800s. Uh, in fact, any kind of stable society virtually collapsed from the pressure of outside attacks during the late 800s, uh, outside attacks from Mo uh, Moors and Magyars and Vikings. Uh, the, there, was, there was really no strong government left, no, no, no strong society left. Uh, by the beginning of the 900s, people had to find some way to organize their lives, both politically and economically. <clears throat> now, over the next couple of hundred years, um, medieval Europeans developed new but relatively primitive ways of restoring economic and political order. The economic system they developed we call manorialism, uh, and the political system that they developed, we call feudalism. And, and I should probably inform you up, up front uh, that these terms, feudalism and manorialism, are never actually used in the Middle Ages. They're terms that later historians would apply, and still do apply, to a series of agricultural and social and political and economic uh, conventions that grew up in Europe uh, in the 10th and 11th centuries. Uh, feudalism is a vague term invented by historians to describe a complicated pattern of social, political, and military arrangements that developed during the course of the Middle Ages. Manoralism, similarly, is a term that historians have come up with to describe a, a really broad range of agricultural systems and activities uh, up over the same period. Now, some scholars even argue that feudalism and manoralism never really existed at all that they're sort of the, the feverish constructs of historians who, who really like to look for patterns of, of things in order to come up with some kind of explanation of history. The term feudalism describes a, a broad range of political and, and social activities, uh, and, and it would be ridiculous, these historians say, to, to to assume that feudalism ever really existed in, in a pure form, and of course they're quite right. Feudalism never really existed as a, as a sort of a, a textbook case in Europe. 
Uh, the term describes a complex of institutions uh, that never really existed in a pure form anywhere in Europe, and the same is true with manorialism. Um, in general, both terms are used in order to you have a word uh, that, that various historians can sort of understand and relate to when it comes to the, the various social and economic and, and uh, political activities that took place in Western Europe in the, in the Middle Ages. So let's start with the economic system called manorialism first. The, f the main thing to write down about manorialism is that it is primarily an economic system based on agriculture. Well, ever since the late Roman Empire, the cities of Western Europe had been declining in size and population due to political disorder. Industry and trade gradually disappeared, and in the early Middle Ages, farming became almost the only way to produce wealth. And of course, farming provided the necessities of life to the people who were living in Western Europe. The organization of manorialism grew out of the way that farming was carried out at the end of the Roman Empire. By the late empire, a great deal of the land in Western Europe had been owned by wealthy people and farmed as large plantations called latifundia. Originally, these plantations were worked by slaves, primarily enormous tracts of land worked by slaves, which if you think about it is rather like the plantation system in the old American South. But in the late empire, slavery began to decline. The number of slaves in Western Europe began to decline, and landowners gradually replaced slave labor with a system of what we might call tenant farming. Uh, in the late empire, these great estates were divided up into sections, and each section was rented out uh, to a farmer and his family. The tenants were like sharecroppers in the Old South. They gave part of what they produced to the owner uh, as, as rent, and they lived on what was left. These tenant farmers were free, uh, that is, they were not owned by the landlord, they paid rent, they were free, but they really didn't have much of anywhere to go they had no real opportunity to leave the estate and find employment elsewhere. And then as we have seen, the Emperor Diocletian created a law that said that peasant farmers couldn't leave the land on which they worked. They were tied to the land for generation upon generation. And, and this is really the basis of manorialism. Now, this is a system that spread over much of Western Europe in one form or another uh, by the reign of Charlemagne. German tribal chiefs and war leaders possessed the land, and other tribal members worked the land for themselves and their chiefs. In the case of areas dominated by Germans, uh, who had settled in parts of the old Roman Empire, many of the tenant farmers were members of the earlier population, the non-German population, who had been small landowners themselves, perhaps, or who had been tenant farmers under the old Latifundia system. Now these folks became tenants to the Germans who possessed the land when the Germanic tribes came into Europe and took it over. When order broke down after 850, the peasants became completely dependent on the great landowners, 
because the great landowners possessed the means of protecting themselves uh, that only wealthy, wealthy landowners could afford. And, and, and they were usually warriors, so they were capable of protecting not only themselves, but also their tenants. Okay, so how did manorialism work? First, most of the farmland in Europe was divided up into large estates that we call manors, so that that's where the term manorialism comes from. What manor lands consisted of and how they were arranged differed uh, from place to place in Western Europe, as did the actual organization of society on the manors themselves. Uh, in, in some areas, especially in England uh, and Germany, manors were generally entirely rural. Uh, the center of the manor was the great manor house, usually a fortified dwelling where the lord of the manor lived. Uh, the tenants who worked the land lived in cottages spread out around the manor and worked tracts of land adjacent to the cottage. In, in, in France, the general blueprint of a manor was rather, difficult, uh, rather different. Uh, in France, the serfs, the tenant farmers, lived together in a small village surrounded by farmland and, and, of course, they worked the surrounding lands. Um, no matter how the manor was laid out, though, each manor had a lot of peasants who lived and worked on it. Uh, they were called serfs, S-E-R-F-S, -S, not the, the U kind, uh, serfs. Serfs, again, are not slaves. Nobody owns them, but they are bound to the land of the estate. They are bound to the manor. Uh, this condition was hereditary. The children of serfs would be serfs themselves in the same place. <coughs> Each manor was either owned or controlled by a nobleman who was simply known as the lord of the manor. The nobleman might own the land outright that is, over year, uh, generations of occupation, his family has acquired ownership of the land. Or he might have received the land uh, as a fief from his feudal lord. And this will make more sense in a few minutes when we talk about feudalism. A nobleman in the Middle Ages was a knight or a soldier usually a mounted warrior. After all, the way that you kept your property was by defending it from everybody else, and that required that you have military skills and equipment, and usually an, uh, a, a little army of your own, an entourage of other soldiers, uh, and of course the ability to command those warriors in the field. The serfs and lords had certain duties that they had to provide to each other. Now, there were, this is not writ, there's no written contract during this period. It's not a, a formal legal thing. These duties are determined by tradition and custom. Um, well, who, who owes who what? Because the serfs are peasants and the lords are noblemen, as we might expect, the duties of the serfs are much greater than the duties and obligations of the lord. First of all, the serfs had to do all of the farm work on the manor. The, the lord did no farming. Uh, the serfs planted and harvested crops 
Uh, they cared for the animals and livestock. They collected the eggs and the milk. They did all of the stuff you would expect people to do in a farming community. Uh, sir, how serfs worked the land varied uh, I I from place to place. In some few cases, the serfs worked together as a whole uh, on the manor for greatest efficiency. In, in other cases, the land was split up among the various tenant families, the various serf families. Uh, each family uh, got a plot of land that was theirs to work. Uh, if the land was divided up like that, then there would be one very large chunk of land that was devoted entirely to the Lord. And the serfs were required to plant it and harvest it first, the Lord's land first, before they could work on their own lands. And even so, they were still required to give a small percentage of the, of the, the, the food produced on their land to the Lord in rent. Well, no, no matter how it worked, no matter how it was set up, in general we can say each serf was allowed to produce enough food for himself and his family and produce enough food to pay some kind of rent to the Lord. Uh, uh, the Lord did no farming work himself. Yeah. Serfs were also required to do all the other labor on the manor as well. Uh, they had to maintain the manor house as well as their own cottages. Uh, they were required to, to, to work on the roads leading into and across the manor uh, so that goods could be carried into and out of the manor. Um, serfs also had to pay certain kinds of other taxes that are called aids to their lord in the, in the shape of a part of their crops, a part of what they have grown. Now, these taxes are called aids again. For instance, there was usually a fee for grinding corn at the Lord's mill. And the Lord himself essentially had a monopoly on the milling of grain. And so in order to use the, in order to use the mill, then the, uh, the serf would be required to give a portion of his grain to the miller. He wouldn't have a choice. There's no competition. That's the only place they can get their wheat converted into flour. So the serf would pay a little bit of money, or a little, I shouldn't say money, a little bit of his grain to the Lord, and usually a little bit to the miller as well, for the privilege of using the mill. Now, when a serf died, often he had to pay some kind, or his, his family had to pay some kind of estate tax some kind of death tax. It might be a nice piece of furniture or a nice piece of livestock, a pig or a cow. Uh, <coughs> it could be cheese or the best of the wine that they had, the family had produced during the previous year. But some kind of death tax, inheritance tax, would go to the Lord. Uh, serfs had to get permission to marry, uh, and it might not be given if a serf wanted to marry someone from a neighboring manor. Serfs might also be required to give their lord a certain amount of military service if it was necessary to do so as well. Well, that's what the serfs had to give. That was what they were responsible for. Let's take a little look at what they got, uh, what, the, what, the, uh, what the lord of the manor owed his serfs. <clears throat> in return for their services. First of all, the serfs got economic security. Uh, really, the two most important things is economic security and, 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 uh, and protection from marauding enemies. So economic surf, uh, security. Neither they nor their descendants could be driven off the land. They belonged there. In fact, some serfs could make a better claim to belonging to the land than their lord could. 
because the serfs may have been on the land for generation after generation after generation, the Lord may have received the manor as a thief uh, only recently. So, this may not seem like much, the fact that the serfs could not be driven off the land, but we need to remember that these were very, very hard times indeed, uh, and it was a matter of life and death for a peasant and his family if he had no land of his own uh, to, on, on which to produce food. It, 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 was a, it was a matter of life and death that he have some land, even if it was tenant land, on which to produce the livelihood for his family. In times of attack, serfs, could take refuge in the manor house of the Lord, which was usually fortified, and the Lord was required by custom to provide his serfs with protection from invasion or attack. This protection was a matter of mutual interest, of course. A serf would not survive attacks or invasions without support and shelter, and the Lord needed the labor of his peasants, his serfs, in order to produce wealth, in order to live himself. The Lord was also called upon to provide his serfs with justice, that is, to judge disputes between serfs and to provide them with some kind of equitable judgment. Uh, that, would, that, would, that would determine uh, who was right, who was wrong, uh, who was guilty, who was innocent. The Lord presided over an institution called the manor court, where his serfs could receive some degree of justice and settlements of their complaints against each other. The manor lord usually judged cases based on tradition and based on his own sense of what was fair and what was right. Um, there, there was no written body of law upon which judgments were made. Roman law was all but lost in most of Western Europe by the 900s. Often, trials were based on older Germanic traditions in which the guilty party had to pay money to compensate his accuser. This money was called Weirgeld. And usually, both parties in the trial had to pay something to their, their lord. Both parties had to pay something to their lord for judging the case. In addition to these other things, protection, land, uh, security, uh, justice, the Lord also was expected to provide food for his serfs in times of a bad harvest until they could pay him back. Now, this could be ruinous for a great Lord because if the harvest is poor, the chances are the harvest has been poor everywhere in the region the Lord lives, and he is required then to pay real money, pay cash, in order to buy enough grain to feed his serfs to tide them through until the next harvest. If a second harvest is bad, then it, 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 the, the, the prices of grain would become ruinously expensive, and the Lord is still expected to find food for his serfs. Now, he could refuse to do it, but if he did so, uh, his, his, his friends, his fellow lords, would, would consider him to be a pretty evil fellow because, after all, he's violating tradition. And his, his serfs would probably figure out ways to get back at him. So, so the importance here is that tradition defines these duties, and in the Middle Ages, tradition is very important indeed. In practice, of course, there's no way for the serfs to force the Lord to live up to his obligations. If he didn't want to, 
but custom required that he do so. And as I said a minute ago, custom is very strong in a society that doesn't have much of anything else in the way of social controls. But again, I should stress that this is a very one-sided relationship that operates primarily for the benefit of the great lords, those who control the lands. So that's manoralism in a nutshell. Uh, for the rest of the lecture, I want to take a look at feudalism. Now first, write down that feudalism is a word we use to represent a rather primitive form of government that grew up uh, after 850 A.D. in Western Europe. When organized government collapses after about 850, uh, people in Western Europe need to defend themselves. They need some way to cooperate with one another to provide order, and feudalism becomes essentially what they have. Now, to create the system, they looked for forms of cooperation that had existed earlier. Uh, there were several of these customary arrangements, and medieval leaders sort of mixed and matched them. Uh, they, we've already looked at a few of them. Let me, let me give you some examples. First, the Romans, I hope you remember, had an institution for formal co cooperation based on an agreement between a patron and a client to exchange favors with each other. The Roman uh, patron would give his dependent money or represent him in the law courts or help him with his political career. In return, the client voted for his patron's interests in the assembly or when his patron ran for office, and clients provided patrons with personal protection. Additionally, among the Germans, there was a form of personal cooperation in war that created the German war band, also known as the Comitatus. The greater warriors led, uh, uh, led war bands and looked after the interests of the soldiers who fought under them. In return, in return the soldiers fought for their war chief, their leader. In addition, the church had an institution which involved the use of land as well. Since land was a source of wealth, it was also a source of power and could be used uh, in, a, in, a, in a system to promote cooperation. This institution in the church was called a, benef a benefice, benefice. It was a way of paying church officials with land to do their job. Now, th since there's no money, the church official was allowed to live off the income of a piece of land called a benefice while he was in office. The land was the benefice. The idea was extended to noblemen under Charlemagne, and it would provide a, a, a basis for... Um, creating an obligation within a vassal, as we're going to see. Using these institutions, members of the upper class in medieval Europe, who were soldiers or knights, began to make personal agreements to help and defend each other. The process began in France. The form of these agreements was determined by custom and the precedents that we talked about earlier. Tradition ruled instead of any formal legal system, much as was the case with manoralism. This was an agreement, though, the feudal agreement, was considered to be an agreement between social equals. Although the principles in the feudal agreement were socially equal, the relationship itself, the feudal relationship itself, 
makes one of the parties to the agreement theoretically superior to the other. The senior partner in a feudal contract is called the suzerain or the overlord. The junior partner is called a vassal. Under this agreement, each man had to provide certain things to the other. There might be variations from place to place, but these agreements follow a general pattern and that's why we label them all as the feudal agreement. Now, this is what the caesarean, the, 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 the superior member of the agreement, this is what the caesarean gives to the vassal. The most important thing that he gives to the vassal is land. This land might be a single estate, a single manor, or it might be a, a, an enormous area of land broken down into lots of smaller estates. Of course, the serfs who live on these estates sort of a part of the package with the land. The vassal did not own this land. He merely had a right to use it and draw income from it in payment for his services. The land which is given in this fashion by the caesarean to the vassal, this land is called a fief, F-I-E-F. -F. The word feudalism comes from the Latin word for fief, which is foitus. Well, the caesarean was also required to defend his vassal from the attacks of others, and he helped to settle disputes among his vassals. If he had <coughs> two vassals that had a dispute with each other, they had the right to come to their feudal lord, to their caesarean, and he had the obligation to make a judgment, to straighten them out, as it were, and send them on their way. The caesarean also had agreed to take care of the vassal's children and widow. If the vassal died before the children became adults, uh, there were no laws that did that. There was no, if you will, social safety net. That became a responsibility of the feudal overlord. Uh, he had a responsibility to marry off the daughters of his vassals who died in his service. And he had a responsibility in many ways to marry off the widow as well so that somebody would have the fief, some male would have the fief. Well, what does the vassal provide to his overlord? In almost every case, he was required to provide military service. Now, not all the time and not continuously. The, the amount of time was limited by the feudal agreement. And in fact, in France, uh, usually that time was limited to 40 days service a year. A vassal could only be required to give 40 days of military service to his overlord per year. Uh, they could also be required, vassals could also be asked to come to the overlord's court and help him make various kinds of decisions for his vassals. Uh, to, the, the term is to render advice. So an overlord might call a group of his vassals to come to his castle, come to his, his capital, whatever that might be, and advise him on important policies, important affairs. The vassal was also required to give hospitality. That is, if his overlord showed up at his front door at, at some point with maybe a couple of hundred of his best friends, the vassal was required to put the overlord and his entourage up 
uh, for as long as the overlord wanted to stay with him. Well, together, the vassal and the suzerain, the vassal and the overlord, provide each other with the equivalent of government services, which really didn't exist in the period of the, uh, of the Middle Ages uh, in any other form. There were formal ceremonies that solemnized the agreement, legitimized, if you will, the agreement uh, between the vassal and his lord uh, and, and made it a real contract between two parties. Uh, the, the, the lord went through a ceremony in which he accepted the vassal and conferred on him the fief. This ceremony is called an investiture. Uh, this agreement that took place between the vassal and his overlord was a real contract. That is, both men had certain obligations toward each other and both had certain rights in relation to each other. The individuals who made the contract weren't expected to break out of the contract, to back away from the contract, and the contract was also hereditary. Uh, the descendants of the Caesarean would be overlords and Caesareans to the vassals and to their children. This contract, this feudal contract, was expected to extend across time, extend across generations. If one of the parties to the contract died, his, his, his children would take his place. If either party violated the contract, if either party violated the contract, the other could consider it dissolved to his advantage. For, for instance, if the vassal didn't live up to his part of the contract, the suzerain could proclaim him a contumacious vassal and take back the land, take back the fief. Uh, if the suzerain, the overlord, failed to keep his end of the bargain, the vassal no longer had to provide him feudal service of any kind and could keep the fief as his own. The, the piece of land that had been, had been sort of lent out by the overlord would become the private property of the vassal if the overlord broke his end of the agreement. Now, <clears throat> That's the theory. Uh, in practice, though, it doesn't necessarily work out that way. There are no courts to enforce this contract. Uh, if, if you're cheated, either, either as an overlord or a vassal, it's not like you can go get yourself a lawyer and run to court and get this settled. It, it, there are no courts, so the vassal isn't necessarily at a disadvantage if he, uh, if he, ha if he breaks uh, the contract. Uh, the offended party might have, well, might have to use force to assert his claim. If the vassal is stronger in terms of having uh, uh, more and more vassals himself, then the vassal may be able to make war against his overlord and uh, uh, ha will have a distinct advantage in that case. Uh, the, the vassal might have estates of his own. He might have, uh, um, have given out many fiefs of his own. He may be as great a caesarean as his overlord is, as his caesarean is. Uh, there are several good ad ad uh, um, examples of this. For instance, the King of England was the Duke of Normandy, and as the Duke of Normandy, he was the, uh, he was the vassal to the King of France. But 
in quarrels between the King of France and the King of England. Uh, the King of England, the Duke of Normandy, same guy, could bring out thousands of English knights and English, uh, English uh, uh, vassals to support him in his feud with France. Uh, another good example is the Duke of Burgundy, who by the 1400s owns, has control of almost as much land as the King of France does and has a, an, or, an army of vassals that is at least as, as large as the Capetian King's vassals. So just because you're a vassal doesn't mean you don't have a great deal of power in your own right. Uh, and, and just because you're a vassal doesn't mean you also aren't an overlord as well. Uh, as we'll see later, the kings of European countries would become the Caesarians, the overlords of the principal noblemen of that country. Uh, and, and therefore, theoretically, the, uh, the kings of most Western European countries had enormous feudal power over their feudal state. But again, uh, unless the kings had great ability and had enormous estates with direct feudal control over a large number of their vassals, uh, it was entirely possible that there would be vassals uh, in their own state, in their own country, who were at least as powerful as they were. Well, we've talked about feudalism and manorialism. Uh, we have seen these basic institutions that characterize economic, social, and political relationships in the Middle Ages. Uh, you should understand the differences between them. You should understand, for instance, that manorialism is an economic organization, while feudalism is a primitive form of government. Uh, the two dovetail, the two come together uh, through the land. The fiefs uh, are made up of various manors and estates, which of course are, are used, are employed and exploited through manorialism. Uh, these two systems didn't depend on each other completely for their existence, but nevertheless there is a very important interrelationship between the two. Manorialism, I should point out, began long before feudalism emerged and would continue long after feudalism was replaced. For the remainder of this course, feudalism will play a more important role, though, than manorialism uh, because in, in these kinds of survey courses, we look a lot more at politics than we do at economics or agriculture. Uh, it may seem, feudalism may seem to be a very, very strange and very in, unstable uh, form of government to us, but the origins of most of the institutions that characterize the governments of Western Europe today began with feudalism. All right, so now that we've learned about the development of feudalism, when we come back for our next lecture, we're going to discuss the Holy Roman Empire, which will be centered in Germany, what will become, of course, uh, Germany that we know today. But it encompasses, of course, more than just uh, modern Germany. And we'll learn about the development of the Holy Roman Empire and we'll see how the Holy Roman Empire will be an integral part of the political scene uh, in Europe for quite some time. Until next time.